Hi everybody and welcome to the rundown of my favourite PC games of 2014. It's been a strange year for both games and gaming culture. The latter half of the year was marred by a very nasty exchange between what felt like thousands of different groups of people, all in unison, all talking directly from their collective arses. And while there might have been the odd reasonable person making sense here and there, the majority just seemed content with flinging poop at each other and everyone else. It was quite sad. But I don't want to focus on too much of the nasty stuff. I want to put the focus back squarely onto the playing of video games, which I know we've done a lot of in 2014. I want the focus to be on having a good time. I want to focus on the PC games I enjoyed the most in 2014. Yet it hasn't been an easy one compiling this list. 2014 saw an abundance of what I like to refer to as a load of balls. Yes, broken games are plenty to be honest, and you know, your Assassin's Creed and stuff. Perhaps people would actually be better off, think about this for a second, hashtagging about the money grabbing, suit wearing gobshites that, uh, you know, call themselves publishers. Maybe that'd be time better spent, who knows. Anyway, nonsense and hate mongering aside, I made a list of 10 games. They'll be in chronological order, because I'm bad at picking favourites. <coughs> Alien! <coughs> but um, without further delay, here are the games. The Banner Saga is one of the earlier releases that caught my attention, namely due to the fact that it came out in January very early on. It's a bleak, snowdrift covered Viking tactical RPG. Yep, all of those words. All of those words combined. And it's really as good as it sounds, it's really awesome. The game really shines when it comes to the storytelling aspects and selling the world that you're in, with all of its emotionally complicated decisions and situations that you encounter on your journey. I do feel like the game lacks in the tactical department. The strategic combat is a little shallow. That said though, it makes the game more appealing to casual gaming fans. I hear a lot of people enjoyed it on the iOS devices and Android, so that's a cool thing. What I do love about the game is the hand-painted art style and the game sound. Game sounds fantastic. I think the soundtrack's by Austin Vintory. And um, it also happens to be one of several crowdfunded games that made its way onto my list this year. Build a town, help the little bugger grow, control the entire thing in which your townspeople either flourish or straight up die by the hundreds as you scramble to work out what the fuck just happened to everyone. I've always loved a good city builder. But lately it seems that we got shafted when it comes to the bigger games. SimCity came out, it came and it went, it sucked very hard. Goddess is a huge, boring click fest of boring disappointment. If you enjoyed either of those games, I'm sorry, but they're both quite bad. Then along comes one person studio Shining Rock Software with a little game called Banished. Honestly, I think Banished is a great introduction to city builders if you've never played one before, mostly because it's a fairly simple game. I find myself, you know, getting involved, getting invested into the game, and getting into a very zen-like state as I spend hours building these sprawling towns and farms and making sure my townspeople have everything they need. Unfortunately, on normal difficulty, the late game can kind of be a bit get set up and let it do its thing. Yeah, hard mode can occasionally throw some curveballs at you, but it's not too much great in the late game. Thankfully though, there's recently been Steamworks support added for the game, so hopefully a couple of great minds, or several great minds, can collectively work together to get some code done for some mods, might even polish off the end game and banished. Who knows? I think we can all agree that the problem with Dark Souls 2 is that it isn't Dark Souls 1. While it's still great, and a faithful sequel to a game that was loved by so many people, it gets a lot of stuff right, but it gets so much of it wrong at the same time. It's not a bad game, by any stretch of the imagination, or else it wouldn't be on the list at all. I mean shit, I still think about the game a lot, I think about all of the annoying crap, the poorly designed levels, the tiresome areas with too many enemies, but then I remember all the cool stuff, like how multiplayer worked well, and the scale of the task at hand, you're dropped in Drang Lake with this massive world to explore and witness all of the stuff there, and it's a dark and decayed and doomy world full of just horrible stuff, and that stuff's really cool, but at the same time it still isn't Dark Souls 1. But what does it get right? What's so great about Dark Souls 2? For starters, Dark Souls 2 refines many of the mechanics in Dark Souls 1 that fell short, like online multiplayer. It actually works in Dark Souls 2. The Bellkeeper invasions and fighting on the, the Iron Keep Bridge were excellent fun and I enjoyed that so much. New Game Plus is really good in Dark Souls 2. You could go through 10 New Game Pluses and you know you witness new things and new things happen and it's all very exciting. You get new boss encounters and new enemies to fight. On the other hand, the levels and the level design isn't really that great. The characters feel a bit bland and there's not really much going on there. And it's just not on par with the world and the stuff that you do in, in Lord Ran in the first Dark Souls game. But, still, I played through Dark Souls 2 blind. I had a lot of fun with the game. I died more times than I'd wish to admit. 
but you can go back and watch my let's play of it, and I still enjoyed the game an awful lot even though it frustrated me to no end. Arguably one of the, the prettiest games of the year, especially one of the prettiest games on the list today, Transistor looks beautiful, and it's a great follow up to Supergiant's critically acclaimed action RPG Bastion, similar in many respects, probably to a fault. The game's very samey to Bastion, but I do let the sameness slide because the game is great, I played through it twice and, and I really enjoyed it both times. Not only does the game look superb, but on par with, with Bastion, the, the music and the narration in the game are both second to none, some of the best that you'll hear in any game this year. Some people may be bothered by the length of the game, somewhere between 5 to 10 hours depending upon how long it takes you to play through a game and what you do and what you like to explore, but if you love Bastion, you'll probably love Transistor and it's well worth your time. Just Who would have thought an RPG lifted from the early 2000s would have done so well in 2014? Well, Belgian development team Larian Studios had an inkling about that, and so did thousands of people on Kickstarter, also conveniently making this the second crowdfunded game on the list today. So Divinity Original Sin is great, it's a fantastic game. It reminds me fondly of the time I spent playing Neverwinter Nights all of those many years ago. Like 12 years ago, makes me sound old. Divinity grasps what was great about those older western RPGs and transposes it to a modern game. And you play a lot of rock, paper, scissors, which is cool! That leads to one of the more interesting parts of the game, the dialogue choices you get, especially when you're playing co-op. If you and your co-op partner can't agree, you can always just do a rock, paper, scissors and find out what you're going to do or how you want to proceed, and I think that's an amazing way to, to implement role-playing into the game. And honestly, it's the first game I've played in a while where I've actually felt like I've been role-playing in the game. It's amazing. Now, the world in Divinity is fairly standard. It's like kind of some nice town or place that's been done in by a couple of necromancers that thought raising the dead would be a good laugh. And you're tasked to go in and kind of sort the place out by doing various quests like, you know, finding sheep and making pies and do whatever else you do in these games. But it's all a lot of fun, and it's mostly because of the characters in the world and the NPCs that give the world life. Like the one guy that sells cheese, and he's so into selling cheese it makes me happy. Whenever I hear him talking about cheese, I crack up. His jokes about cheese are terrible, his, everything about him is terrible, his life must suck. But he makes me happy because he makes the world feel alive. Likewise with all the animals. Although they shouldn't really sound like Edwardian gentlemen when you speak to them, you say hello and they go, Oh, how do you do, sir? Which is kind of weird. But still, I like it a lot, and it just makes Divinity a really unique and charming game. The Ancient Art of Chivalry. You're gonna have to call on all your shoveling skills to save the day. And Shovel Knight, a fantastic game. Also the third crowdfunded game on the list. It's just utterly fantastically brilliant, and I enjoyed my time with it an awful lot. It's a classic styled action platformer with flashes of modern gaming. Think Dark Souls with a shovel. No, forget what I just said, that was a joke. What it's more like is like kind of Mega Man and Mario. Maybe a bit of DuckTales thrown in, but with kind of modern flashes, things going on, it's really interesting. And what you have to do is take your shovel, and you have to quest to beat the Enchantress, and find your true love, Shield Knight. And all the lovey-dovey stuff in the game is actually really touching, and I usually don't get soppy in games, but the music, combined with the, the love story, made me feel a bit mushy inside, Big Tam crying into his beard. It was a shame. But what they do is they draw on the old 8 and 16 bit uh, consoles for inspiration, as I said, things like Mega Man and Mario and um, DuckTales all combined to make Shovel Knight a really, really great game. And it does stand up against those, those older generation games very, very well. I could spend all day brawling with a group of orcs, just lopping those fat, disgusting heads off one at a time. And it's great, it's actually one of gaming's highlights of the year. Lord of the Rings, Batman, Assassin's Creed, all of these things basically combined. On the surface at least, it's actually way better than that when you get playing it. So Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor is one of the few games that made me think this year that we're actually truly approaching next gen territory. Specifically speaking of the Nemesis system, how the Nemesis system generates like new orc enemies for you every playthrough and they'll be completely different to your previous playthrough, or to someone else's playthrough, they'll all have randomly generated names and traits and feelings and you'll build different relationships with these orcs. If you fight one and you lose, that orc will remember when you come back. If one runs away, it will remember for later. And they begin to even have these interactions between their own social standings while this is all happening. And it's amazing! And it's just, it's really cool to watch. 
Admittedly, things did tend to get a bit tiresome drawing near to the end of the game. The dwarf dude was unnecessary, I felt. The second area kind of felt unnecessary as well. That's just for me, though. Other people will think that the length of the game was fine. I thought it maybe drew on a little too much. But was it ever about the story? I think it was more so about just cutting heads off. This is just one battle. You will lose the war. Shit. Finally, we did it. We finally managed to get it done. Somebody made an alien game that isn't awful. In fact, Alien Isolation is amazing. Truly, utterly harrowing, full of suspense and fear and horror. It made me feel terrible and great at the same time. It's a game worthy of ranking right up next to Ridley Scott's 1979 classic Alien. Alien Isolation just nails everything I had to nail. It's bleak and gritty and it's got that 1980s retro futurism look. Absolutely nailed it. Excellent sound design. Even reading some interviews it said that they had approached Fox who gave them old magnetic tape audio to use in the game which they did. That's amazing. The horrible alien that you just can't kill and it hunts you and it's terrifying. It's awesome. It's so good. And I'm, I'm a big alien fan. I've made it clear when I was playing the game. But the game just it truly surpassed every expectation that I had. The alien itself and the adaptive AI gave us one of the year's greatest baddies. Just this living, learning, horrible monster that keeps following you around and, you know, waiting there existing just to fuck you up. And that's great. I love it. But, you know, the second half of the game was kind of sucky. It wasn't really required. I thought the game should have ended kind of midpoint. It kind of drags on a little. Maybe they should have kind of cut off bits and, and... But, you know, I can forgive them. I can forgive them because what they done was they made... They made something brilliant. Creative Assembly managed to nail what they wanted to nail right, which was the alien. And I love the game. Absolutely love it. The Bind of Isaac is a game loved by many people. And I think its charm lies in the game's imperfections. All of the silly stuff like the glitches and the broken items and the odd synergies and the weird things you can do. The player can then take all this stuff and they can drop on their knowledge of all of the mistakes in the game, all of the charming little bugs, and they can use that to make really seriously silly runs. And I think that's awesome. So how do you take that game and then remake it so that it works as it was originally intended, add all new items, and then not make it seem boring? Honestly, I've no idea. But Edmund, with the help of Nicholas, of course, managed to do this. They managed to nail it. I like to think it all comes down to the way the game feels, or game feel in general. Make me, as I'm playing the game, feel super powerful, and then let me see that power on the screen. So, you know, you want a huge blood laser with homing shot that makes a whole room of things die instantly in one burst? Yeah, fire in, take that, you have that big old green beam that arcs and moves around the screen and kills everything. You take it and you enjoy that. And I think that's why Rebirth is so good. Always wanted those kind of synergies, and now I have them in the game. I feel like Rebirth also has a better sense of progression than original Isaac or Wrath of the Lamb. I think it's articulated better by way of the post-it notes and the character selection screen, of course. And I like things like being able to pause the game or, or press tab and see your map or see what time you're on and how far you're through the run. I also enjoy the new character, Eden. I like all of those new things. Unfortunately, the new stuff like Hard Mode and The Lost are not so good. I don't like Hard Mode. It kind of drags the fun out of the game if you're constantly being hit with curses and lacking in heart drops and things. Likewise with The Lost. The Lost is just a, a bit too rough for my liking. But on the other hand, it's, it's a great game and loads of people enjoyed it. And I know many people have spent many, many hours playing it this year. Definitely one of the best games of the year. A game about war where you don't actually play as the super soldier that kills everyone. That's awesome. That's cool. I like that. In this war of mine, you basically play a group of civilians trying to survive and live day to day as your home, your town, your city is being torn apart by war. It's a fantastic game. Full of suspense and really depressing situations and situations that you really ideally would never want to be in personally. And you feel for these characters you're playing as. You feel for the people as they as they die or, or as they have to deal with situations where their friends die or they see things or they have to steal from other people. And I think that's amazing. The sneaking and the looting part of the game is especially fun. You go out at night and you go into, say, a warehouse that's full of bandits and you have to get your way through and steal the stuff just so you can survive. And you have to make these decisions if you want to go and steal from a family. You can do that as well. And then what you do is you take your stuff home and you can upgrade your home base with kind of resource management type stuff and upgrades and things. I like all of that stuff. It feels like a proper survival game. 
and granted the combat in the game is a bit wonky and doesn't feel particularly great, but, you know, I'm not going to take any points off the game because the general idea and premise of the game is fantastic. It's just one hell of an experience. Certainly not for the faint-hearted, though. And so concludes the list of my favourite PC games of 2014. Let me know in the comments what your favourite games of 2014 were, and also let me know what you think of my list. If you enjoyed the video, remember to leave a like, and if you're new here, feel free to subscribe as well. All the best, and I wish you all a happy 2015! Woo!